This talk is kind of a reduced version of a tutorial that I taught yesterday in the morning from 9 uh, to noon. And I go through you know, some examples of what we did yesterday. But really, this talk is really meant more to be kind of like a technical quick start. So I provide a lot of links. And so this talk will be posted on the talk you know, page description. Um, but I provide a lot of links for all the different tools and resources that I mentioned. So hopefully, you know, you guys can check out those items and um, explore a little bit more on your own. And of course, you're welcome to talk to me after the presentation. So my name is Jenny Palomino. I am a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. Um, my department is actually environmental science, but a lot of people in our department do all kinds of geospatial analysis, um, you know, working with Python, R, um, yes, even ArcMap. <laughs> you know, we're at an open source conference, but a lot of people use ArcMap still, um, and we do in our department as well. But you know, increasingly, we as a whole department, and specifically the Geospatial Innovation Facility, which is our GIS support lab, is moving towards more open source um, and web-based you know, software solutions. So I'll be mentioning a little bit of that you know, throughout the talk. So as I said, this is like a technical quick start. Um, this is sort of the flow of the presentation. I'm going to be you know, sort of briefly talking about spatial types and formats, uh, map projections very briefly. Um, I'm going to get into Python, what it is, how to use it, how can you get started, um, talk about open source Python packages. I'll give two different examples from things that we did yesterday in the tutorial in Python Rasterio. Um, do a little bit of comparison of Python to other options that are available out there, such as ArcMap, QGIS, R, some of those um, softwares that you might be familiar with, and then you know, conclude with some open source web options for publishing your data, including ones that are Python based, and then you know, recluding there with the online free resources that I'm sure everybody will be excited to see. So as before we get started, can I see a raise of hands of people that you know, sort of actively work with spatial data? in ArcMap or, wow, great, okay, so then I don't really have to go through this very much, right? You guys are familiar with primary data types, you're familiar with primary data formats, right? But just briefly, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, so vector data, you know, tends to um, look like things that you would see um, in a vectorized map, right? So maybe something like Google Maps, you have points, lines, and polygons representing things. Lines could be roads, polygons could be you know, parcels, um, houses, um, but those could also be represented as points, right? depending on what you're trying to do with your data. Raster data sets, you, know, you basically have two types, your continuous rasters representing you know, some kind of um, surface or gradient, right? so elevation is the example I'm using here. If you're using a discrete raster, that's usually something categorical, right? So land use is a good example of that, um, where you're using codes to represent the land use, but the code itself or the number you know, is, doesn't really mean anything, right? So it's just a representation of whatever data you're wanting to represent. Uh, common data formats, you guys are probably very familiar with this. Um, I've listed GeoJSON as a vector data format, but reality, you can actually store raster data within it. Um, it's maybe not as commonly done. Similarly with HDF5, HDF5 uh, most people tend to use that as more like a raster kind of data set, but you can actually use it for a vector. So I just wanted to point out those two things. Um, continuation of spatial data. I always like to think about where spatial data lives. So we have file formats you know, that live on your computer or your server, right? So kind of mem data stored in memory. Um, we have data structures, right? Data access via syntax, so GeoJSON, or you know, WMS. Um, even you, know, you could throw other you know, options in there. Um, databases, data stored as geometry. Um, so I've listed a couple of examples here to kind of highlight you know, some open source ones and some proprietary versions. Um, and you feel free to explore that on your own. Um, map projections, you guys working with spatial data are very familiar with this, um, but basically quick rundown. It's a way of translating you know, 3D or you know, the globe, right, 3D surface to a 2D map surface, right? So there's lots of different ways to do this. I've just thrown two different examples on here. So the first one on the left is just a visual representation of what the UTM zone 13 looks like if you were to kind of drape it on a 3D surface. And the one on the right is showing the web Mercator projection being used in OpenStreetMap, but you know, those of you who do any kind of web development know that this is used in a lot of other applications like you know, Google Earth and Google Maps as well. So right now it's kind of like the standard uh, mapping projection for web GIS. Python, raise of hands. How many guys actually use Python? 
great. So keep your hand up if you use Python for spatial stuff specifically. OK, very cool. Um, so you might be familiar with a lot of this stuff. I kind of you know, throw up this slide because the one thing I sort of want to <coughs> get across to newbies is that Python is a programming language, right? So it works on your operating system. It is platform independent, right? So you can use it on Macs, Linux, uh, Windows. It's not like a software, right? It's not like a program. So yeah, it's a programming language that can be used in software or used in programs, right? So um, as you kind of see the different examples, it'll start to make a little bit more sense if Python is um, you know, something completely new to you. So using it, um, there's sort of the traditional install, right? So via command line or via some kind of you know, text editor or IDE. This is just an example of idle. Modern options, increasingly a lot of people are using IPython specifically for you know, teaching, um, but also you know, just to have a reproducible you know, set of workflows that you can easily uh, give out to your team. Um, but you know, I also want to highlight here some completely crowd-based options. You know, Python Anywhere is a good option. It's actually featured on the main Python website. Um, it's free to start with it. So that's interesting and you know, cool to kind of check out. Uh, and it's actually really neat. Uh, I was considering using that for the tutorial, but with the internet situation, you know, I wasn't quite sure if that was a good idea. So we ended up going with a traditional install for the tutorial. But check it out if you haven't already. It's a neat option. Distributions, there are a lot of them. There, you know, there's a link down here to others. I'm just sort of highlighting these three, um, particularly because ooh, these are the three that I was you know, promoting for the tutorial yesterday. So for Windows users, WinPython is a really good option. Um, also, if you have ArcMap already installed on your Windows side and you want to not mess with that Python distribution, WinPython is actually like a self-contained distribution. So the way it works is when you install it, it just extracts a folder somewhere, you know, wherever you decide you want to put it, and everything gets installed and, and works within that environment. So it doesn't actually affect your ArcMap installation. Um, which is you know, a concern oftentimes for people using ArcMap. And you know, Anaconda and Canopy, some of you might be familiar with those. And I've just kind of listed the, some packages that are available um, in each of those. And a lot of these different packages were and libraries were used in the tutorial. So um, I was trying to highlight, you know, depending on which one you install, you know, you're going to get different options, um, particularly different version types, and maybe different options depending on which item you install. So Canopy is a good example of that. There is you know, the free version of Canopy, then there's like the full version that you actually have to pay for. Um, but if you are an academic, so you have an email address that ends in .edu, you actually get access to the full version for free. So that's an interesting thing to check out. Um, and the last thing I want to point out is Anaconda and Canopy you know, are meant to work with all you know, the operating systems, Windows, Mac, Linux. When Python is obviously just for Windows, uh, but Anaconda is now making their virtual machines available for use on Amazon Web Services and also just as a file that you download for you to use in VMware or you know, VirtualBox or whatever other virtual machine um, software you have. You know, as far as other kinds of environments, um, <laughs> Berkeley has been trying to sort of solve the Python installation problem uh, at the university. So a group of people have come together to create the Berkeley Common Environment. So it's meant to be a virtual machine specifically for scientific computing. Uh, so I have the website there if you want to check it out a little bit. Another virtual machine that is very popular, so OSGO Live, has a lot of things already installed, um, particularly for open source and web GIS. Um, so check that out if you're interested. So all of those slides were kind of, you know, sort of explaining like how do you actually get started with Python if you're not actually using it, or you know, you might want to explore other environments. Um, this is a list here of different spatial libraries in Python. This is by no means meant to be exhaustive. There are a lot of them, right? Um, and I've listed some links down here, and these are all hyperlinks. Um, and like I said, it'll be posted on the talk page. So you're welcome to download this and share with others. And also, um, if you have any other ones you feel like should be added, you know, please let me know. I was just trying to highlight ones that I actually commonly use and ones that I see a lot in different examples. Um, so you'll see PySAL and Rasterio listed here. And those are actually examples that I'm going to talk a little bit more about now. So PySAL, um, has anyone used it here? So, okay, so cool, so introducing something new to you guys. Uh, so it's short for Python Spatial Analysis Library. It came out of um, sort of a desire to have a new you know, library for spatial statistics. 
So a group of people at Arizona State University put that together and it does a lot of really interesting things um, that are considered like actual traditional data analysis. Um, and the reason why I mentioned that is sometimes different options out there are referred to as geoprocessing options. Um, and you know, in the spatial world, that can mean different things depending on who you talk to. So geoprocessing, oftentimes uh, people use that to refer to things like clipping and buffering. Um, so things that sort of like operations that you're doing um, on a particular data set. And data analysis tends to refer to more analysis or, analysis or statistical analysis, um, or maybe sort of like data mining, right, of your data. Uh, so PySAL specifically meant to do data analysis. It can do some geoprocessing if you add uh, Shapely there. So I've added that at the bottom. Um, so it has some interesting examples of combinations between the two. But PySAL by itself, you know, it's really meant to address some of these spatial um, statistics, you know, that you might want to look at. So spatial autocorrelation, you might want to do some regionalization, which is what this image is here. So there's a road data set and you're trying to look at different groupings of roads. Um, in this case, it's a spatial grouping, but you could do regionalization based on characteristics. So talk a little bit about spatial autocorrelation. Um, has anyone done any kind of spatial autocorrelation before? Okay, so a, a small number of you. Um, there's basically two different ways to talk about spatial autocorrelation. There's a global indicator and there's a local indicator. And it's very much what it sounds like. So the global indicator is looking at an entire landscape and trying to determine you know, how similar or dissimilar are the features to each other within that landscape. Um, so the terminology that's used here is clustering for you know, features being similar to their neighbors or dispersion features being dissimilar to their neighbors. Um, so if you were to calculate a global index, you would end up with values that range from negative one to one. And you know, with uh, the ratio here, so highly clustered would be closer to one, as we see down here at the bottom, and highly dispersed would be closer to negative zero. And then if you are hovering around zero, that means you have no spatial autocorrelation in your data. Another way to look at spatial autocorrelation is you know, a local indicator, which is basically like a hotspot analysis. So you're trying to identify hotspots in your data. The example that I'm going to talk about is using the Moran's Eye global and local indicators, but I've included a link to other indicators because there are a lot out there. So these are just the results from um, yesterday's tutorial, essentially. And actually, I'm going to post the materials from yesterday on the tutorial page. So any of you that are interested in working through these examples, it'll be available on there as well. Um, so this is sort of quickly showing the, the data. So this is an example of crime data, specifically homicide rates, actually, for 78 counties around St. Louis. So the idea here was to look at the data and identify whether or not you know, it looks clustered right across the landscape, but in a statistical manner. So you actually calculate the indicator with a p-value for significance, um, which those of you from the statistics world, that might mean something. If you're not from that world, don't really worry about that. But it's basically a way to um, describe like, how confident you can be about your result. Um, and so in this case, the global Moran's eye was you know, higher than zero, but not quite one. But the statistical analysis actually showed that the p-value was you know, showing that the, that the data was significantly um, clustered. And the hotspot analysis, which is the local um, version of the global Moran's eye, ended up showing three different clusters of hotspots. And I've included links to the CardoDB um, services that I just created quickly for these two things, so for people to explore. So why use PyCell for this? Um, I think there's lots of different reasons, and I tried to condense them to this page. So the first, I guess, group of reasons is if you're using ArcMap already, and let's say you wanted to do spatial autocorrelation, um, it doesn't really give you a lot of options. So it makes it a little bit difficult to try to get statistical significance in like a really robust way. It actually does provide you a p-value in those things, but the um, default setting is to run one run of the random distribution that you're comparing your data set to. And in order for you to actually run multiple versions of that random distribution, you would actually have to write your own code to do that. It currently does not um, do that. So PySAL takes care of that very easily within the function. It's just an extra parameter. You tell it how many runs you want to do. So it makes it very easy. Um, it also allows you to do adjustments of the populations for different, size, um, for different sizes. So the example here is, you know, I was talking about homicide rates for the counties, right? So rates are usually, um, 
at least you know in the crime data, is presented as you know some number of homicides, for example, per hundred thousand individuals in the population, right? So it's already in somewhat of an adjusted way, so you can compare county to county, right? Um, but you know, as you might imagine, if you have an area where there's some large cities or large, you know, towns and other areas that um, have very small towns or very little populations, those rates maybe become not so comparable, right? Because you might imagine that the rate is actually just likely to be higher when you have more people. So this actually allows you to adjust the homicide count now by the county population. So that's some of the stuff that we worked through in the example. Um, as compared to R, the benefit of using Python really is that you get to leverage the benefits of Python. So I've you know, listed an example here of some advanced PySAL uh, coding, which actually incorporates you know, some other um, Python, I should say, syntax or you know, hierarchy. So defining different functions, defining your own classes using inheritance. Um, those things are familiar to you guys if you've been working with Python. And other specific thing I want to mention about you know, working with PySAL versus doing this in R is that it makes it really easy to then embed in desktop or web applications, right? Because then you're just sort of calling and executing a Python um, function or a Python script, depending on how much you have written, as opposed to working with R, which is not as easy to integrate in other applications. Um, I will talk about this at the end, but you know, R does have a new um, you know, tool, I guess, R Shiny that's been coming really popular for trying to get R items, scripts, and data onto the web. Um, but it's still relatively new and it kind of is the only option and Python has a lot of options. So I think this is the benefit of working with um, PySAL instead of R. So the other example that we worked through was uh, raster geoprocessing and data analysis using Rasterio. And Rasterio is an interesting um, you know, library and package, I should say, because it has a lot of other tools available in it, including like a, a command line to, to run its own tools. Um, and basically what it can do for you is a lot of raster calculation and raster manipulation, such as stacking of multiple bands, which becomes important if you're downloading data, say from the USGS and you're interested in getting, you know, Landsat image for your area. Uh, you might know if you've done this before that you actually download each band as an individual, you know, geotiff and that can make it a little annoying when you're doing some calculations or maybe you're trying to actually create um, some composites, right? You want a true color composite of red, gr you know, green and blue bands or maybe you want a false color composite. And so in order to stack them, um, it becomes a little bit annoying to do in other software. Rasterio makes it really easy to do in Python. And last, I have two different examples here of you know, trying to um, write your own histograms and using color maps to actually map your raster values to different you know, red, green, and blue combinations for you know, visual display on your computer. The kind of downside, <laughs> I would say, to Rasterio is that it kind of requires a lot of things, right? Um, so for Mac and Linux, this tends to not be as big of a problem. For Windows users, this can get a little tricky. Um, I provided, you know, an installation guide for the tutorial. So if you guys are interested, you know, feel free to reference that and work through trying to um, get those installed. But the example that we worked through yesterday was calculating a normalized difference vegetation index, which is essentially a way to come up with an index that can compare different pixels based on their vegetative cover. Um, so you end up with, again, an index that ranges from negative one to one. Um, negative one being a closer representation you know, to water, uh, one being you know, sort of like full forest, and in between, you know, around zero, you're looking at barren area or development, so maybe some concrete. Um, and then in the lower values, you're looking at some shrub and grassland. So this is the example that we worked through. It's a geotiff of a Landsat image for the San Francisco Bay Area. On the right is the NDVI result. So around, you know, this negative, uh, around negative one, which that should say negative one, is this red and orange colors, which in this case, you know, kind of highlight uh, water, and all the way to one, which is more of a vegetative cover. And we have some yellow in between that, you know, it's kind of a lower end value of, you know, maybe shrub and grassy areas. 
And last, in terms of examples, I want to quickly highlight GeoPandas, even though I didn't do an example of it, because it's a good package. Um, it tries to bring together the Pandas library and the Shapely library to do you know, geoprocessing, which again, I mentioned before, most people refer to geoprocessing as being these kind of manipulations that you do on the data, such as buffering intersections, unions, difference. The example they have here is actually um, some points in the New York boroughs. And so that's where the color coding comes in. Um, and I believe the points were of gas stations. And they did buffers around the gas stations, uh, about a quarter mile, I believe. And then they did a difference between you know, the buffer of the points and the boroughs to see uh, what areas of the boroughs were not being covered or serviced by you know, these particular gas stations. Um, requires a couple more things than PyCell. PyCell is actually you know, relatively easy uh, to install comparatively. But a lot of these other you know, things that you uh, would need to install, such as Pandas and Shapely, are actually very useful geospatial packages that you should explore. And similarly, I didn't mention that with Rasterio, but you know, it requires GDAL, and it's another package that I highly recommend um, you explore. And um, again, GDAL also has its own command lines and other um, extra tools that you can explore that work you know, sort of side by side with Python and outside of Python. So kind of nearing the end of the presentation, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Python as compared to other spatial tools out there. I think a lot of times when Python is compared to other tools, specifically in the spatial world, people tend to focus really just on this row, right, of analyzing data. Um, I am a developer. I actually create tools as part of my dissertation and PhD work and professionally. So I always take, you know, kind of like the developer look at different things, the sort of a higher level look of, you know, your whole environment and how does a particular option work with all the different components or the different areas of what you actually need to do in your workflow. So I've kind of set that up this way. Um, so setting up your environment, you know, this. All of these things are very subjective, I would say. But you know, if you're trying to maybe sort of look at time and what's required, um, you know, Python can be a little bit difficult for people to get started with. I think once you have your environment set up, it's really easy to install new libraries and uh, you know packages on top of that. Um, but if you're you know a newcomer, you know it can seem a little daunting and a little scary. But there are a lot of resources out there to get people started. Um, and that's why I also included those distributions and the virtual machines as sort of a, a quick start for some of you. But overall, I would rate you know, the open source GIS, such as QGIS, probably the easiest option because it's you know, OS independent, right? So it will run on anything as opposed to ArcMap, which needs Windows um, to run. And it's a relatively easy install. You know, it's actually an executable and you know, has a pretty good GUI. Um, as far as spatial databases go, you know, I think that Python is a clear winner. I mean, R does have you know, different packages available for working with databases, um, but Python is more widely used. And there are, within a lot of database management options, ways to work with Python directly in you know, that environment, as opposed to going from Python to that environment. You can stay in that environment, you know, such as Postgres or um, other options, and actually work with Python within the environment. Um, Analyzing data, this maybe depends on who you talk to, so that's why I kind of bolded both of these. Um, I am from an environmental science department where R is kind of king, um, so that's pretty common in the environmental sciences, but in other sciences, you know, Python is widely used, um, and you know, right now it is one of the top um, programming languages for scientific computing. And, um, I think it handles big data a lot better than R. So one particular example of that is that the default of R has usually been to read in data and then essentially make like a copy of it in memory for it to work with, right? So that's essentially like a duplication of your data. And if you have limited space, you know, that can be a problem. Um, and particularly also if you're trying to run something maybe, you know, that is actually executed through a browser or even through a desktop application, you don't want to be essentially like a memory hog, right? Um, Python, in you know, these different examples, particularly Rasterio, is actually converting the data to something else that is smaller and that it can work with a little bit easier. So in the Rasterio example, it's reading in the GeoTIFF, which as you guys know, is quite a large file, and converting the bands to arrays which are essentially kind of like a list, right? Um, so for each band, you essentially just have a list of the data. And so the manipulations happen on those arrays, and then the array, final array gets spit out and then gets converted back to a geotiff. 
So you go from large data to very small data to all large data again for the output and for the visualization purposes. Um, R essentially would read the large data, it stays as large data, and then it spits out the large data. Um, and there are ways to kind of get around that, but you have to be a little bit more savvy um, of working with R. And then last, you know, in terms of publishing your data, Python just has so many different options. Um, and you know, the other options either are more expensive, such as ArcGIS Server, or are you know, newer, and it's really the only option. So in that case, you know, R Shiny for publishing R data to the web. Open source options to publish data. So I know the talk is about spatial data analysis, but there's kind of no point in doing your analysis if you're not going to get your data out there, right, for people to see in some way. Um, and, you know, obviously publishing to the web or creating a web map isn't the only way, but it's a good way. People like, you know, stories, and visualization, tools. Um, there's lots of different options, so some of the easiest ones I've listed there at the top. You'll notice I mentioned before that I was using CardoDB, you know, to sort of display the simple um, results that we created from PyCell. But there are other options, um, and there's many Python-based options. And you know, I've listed them all here. There's some JavaScript-based options that are also quite good that I want to highlight. So bringing it back to the virtual machine for um, open source of WebGIS, this is a reason why you could be interested in downloading OSGO Live and working with it to actually create your own web maps. This, again, is not an exhaustive list. There are so many free options out there, which is great, right? Um, the top two options, Code Academy and Coursera, are more like you know tutorial courses that build on each other, and you essentially like graduate at the end, right? And so some people like that um, in terms of feeling like they're you know making progress and kind of keeping in with um, a more you know kind of learning, building on other learning um, approach. But there, you know, there's lots of wiki pages um, out there. There's also different books and training that are available. And for those of you, you know, interested in working with Python, you know, within ArcMap, you know, there is ArcPy, and Esri has some free tutorials that you can check out. Um, oftentimes, for people new to Python, you know, ArcPy is a good place to start. Um, if you already have ArcMap. I mean, it is a proprietary license, so it's not free, um, but it kind of gives you an introduction and you know, build a little confidence in Python before you jump out to some of the open source options. Last, I want to highlight that at UC Berkeley, we've actually uh, been working on developing a boot camp that kind of covers a lot of these things. So walking you through setting up the environment, wrangling data, analyzing it, um, and then putting it out on the web. So these are just some examples of things that um, we might do. So the idea is that you know, people would come to the university, work in our computer labs, use our virtual machine setup that would include all these things. Um, and then you know, we would actually provide the virtual machine and instructions for you to take back with you and set up um, on your own computer or your own environment. And you know, it's a three day, workflow with the first day really focused on spatial databases and we're going to be focused on post-GIS uh, specifically. And day two is more the data analysis. So some of the examples that I showed, PySAL, Restier, GeoPandas, those sorts of things would be used on day two and um, a concurrent session on R as well. And then day three is really more focused on WebGIS and some of those options that I've mentioned there. So if you're interested, I put some flyers in the front um, and then there's the date and the website. And that's it. Very quick overview of Python and spatial data analysis. So any questions or comments? Yeah. So every time I start a Python project, I say to myself, is this going to be the one where I can do it all in Python? Oh, uh, yeah. So you need to talk about that. No, <laughs> that's a very good point. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I tend to do this, right? Kind of look at it and see what is it that I actually need to do for this particular project. Um, and I choose tools accordingly. So I wouldn't actually say that I stick strictly in Python. I do a lot of my work in Python, um, but I do a lot of my work in R also. And increasingly, PostGIS is providing a lot of options for doing spatial analysis within it. Um, I haven't done that as much, but I am interested more in doing that because I am a database person. Um, so I don't think there is an easy answer to what you're you know, asking, and I think it's something we all struggle with, um, and it's good to be honest about it. So I would probably say 
you know, kind of using this idea, um, I tend to sort of draw out like a workflow or a pipeline of like all the different steps. And then under each one, I list out what all of my options are. And then I look at the whole thing and see what are the recurring, you know, or the, the top one that keeps showing up in each section, right? Um, so very similar to how I did here. And then I try to see if there's ways to integrate them together. So one example could be maybe there's some things I want to do in Python and some things I want to do in R. And, you know, maybe I use, um, you know, RPI essentially to do that combination. Um, so there's lots of different tools out there for trying to do this kind of interoperability between these different softwares and, you know, programming languages that I didn't mention up here, but that should probably be another slide of, you know, interoperability. I've actually done a whole tutorial on that before. Um, and, you know, there's uh, lots of other tools that, you know, even Esri was exploring for a while. They were creating a package called R Tools to essentially work with R, you know, as an ARC, you know, toolbox. Um, so that's an interesting idea. So people are trying to get around it, but yeah, I don't think there's a clear answer. Great question, though. Can you make a vector data interact with raster data, like uh, doing overlays between vector and raster and abstract uh, uh, summaries for polygons? Yeah, so Rasterio, I didn't mention that, um, but it actually does have an option for vectorizing, you know, raster data and also rasterizing vector data. Um, so. Yes, that's very, it's something you can do in Rasterio. I know that PySAL has options for that as well, but I'm not as familiar with it. So I'm more familiar with that one in Rasterio. Um, so essentially, if you were to do that, everything becomes rasterized. You can do a raster calculation, right? So maybe for, I don't know, some kind of suitability analysis or, or something like that. So. You know, I'm not sure. I know it does file conversions, but I'm not sure to what files. And so, yeah, it's, it actually has a pretty good list on the website. I just haven't really focused on that very much yet. Yeah, so each talk has a description page, and at the bottom, the presenters should be posting their slides. I just haven't done it yet because I was still revising this based on the tutorial yesterday, but I will be doing that. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, um, all, the all the data you, you read, are they automatically indexed in a way so that the uh, mm. fashion index so that it makes like, every computation faster when it try to relate geometry? Yes. Um, so both PyCell and Rasterio do that. They do it in different ways. So I'll, I'll use the Rasterio example for uh, when you open up a particular raster file, say a GeoTIFF. It actually reads in each band as like a separate index. It reads in the bounds and it reads in the coordinate systems and it actually just creates different variables for you know, those things that you can manipulate and work with. Um, so you can do that within you know, actual scripting, like you import Rasterio you know, as a library and you actually script it out, or you can actually work with it in Rio, which is Rasterio's command line, and it's quite good. So you can easily get information like that. Um, with PyCell, it's a little bit different because PyCell can actually read, um, for example, it reads shapefiles really well. So, you know, it kind of maintains that, you know, structure of the multiple files for, for the shapefile. Um, so the way that it brings in the information is a little different. And it's like slightly harder to get to, you know, these sort of different variables um, that are available, but it's, it's there. So I think it's a little bit easier in Rasterio. No, I definitely don't think that there is. Um, these to me are maybe more the easier options for beginners. And so because, you know, it sort of follows like a, a normal like software installation process, right? And so where you go to the website, you download it, you run an executable, and you know, all of a sudden an environment shows up and there's GUIs, you know. Uh, so for example, you know, Canopy has its own interpretive development environment. Um, so it's own IDE that it brings up that you can, you know, do things with. 
So for new people, I think you're new people to Python, I think it's a little bit less scary. You know, it doesn't have all this other terminology that you would need to understand. But in terms of what it actually gives you, I mean, I don't think, yeah, if you're, if you're savvy and you know what you're doing, obviously, you know, set up your environment with other tools that are available. And also these, as I mentioned, are not the only distributions available. If you actually go to the SciPy website, it gives you a lot of different options for other distributions and other ways to install. But that's a good question. So maybe if there is one last question, we're pretty much out of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so huh, it's the easiest way to describe it. Okay. So it's basically like all of the um, different. Okay. So when you download a library or a package, right? What you're actually doing is bringing in a bunch of like other scripts that are referred to when you write something like import PyCell. There's like a set of scripts right, that you've pretty much like downloaded and installed on the computer. So that is you know, what you're doing when you actually install you know, PyCell, say you know, using pip or something. So the wheel file is like a zip version, a zip file version of all of those things kind of compressed into a format that makes it a little bit easier for pip to read. Um, so, so you can type something like pip install and then, you know, gdal.whl or something like that. Um, and so, and also the, you know, wheel files, you can actually do that particular pip install on Windows, which actually makes it really easy. So that's sort of a short version of what the wheel file is. Maybe if someone else has a better definition, please feel free to just chime in. Yeah. Yeah. So there's issues with compilers and Definitely. Which is why some that you can just set and get a big for you. Yeah. Real problems also cause some of the new divine distribution. Yeah, that's a good point. So the REST stereo is actually a good example of that. It requires you to have a C compiler which a lot of Mac and you know, Linux variants would already have. Windows doesn't have that by default. Um, so if you click on this more info, <laughs> it actually you know, lists out different options, including some for Windows, um, like SigWin, or even if you have Visual Studio installed because you develop you know, other kinds of programs, that could work as your C compiler as well. So, okay, well, we're out of time, but I'll be here if anyone has any questions. Thank you.